Welcome to Smart Talk, a series of video application notes, case studies, and general alignment discussions created in conjunction with our users. Joining us this time is Sam Zuckerman. Sam is a senior event technician at the University of Maryland, Baltimore County. Sam, thanks for being with us. Thank you for having me. So Sam, we're gonna look at a, uh, a room that you're responsible for hanging, the uh, UMBC Event Center, and some decisions that you had to make when you had a spoken word event coming in and you had to sort of supplement the house system with your own flow and system for that event. And in particular, we're gonna look at the, some of the work you did in the prediction stages um, and how you sort of went into the prediction software to figure out how you're gonna knit the house system and the event system together. We're going to look at some of the timing decisions that you had to make and some of the pros and cons that you were mentally weighing. And then we're going to uh, do something that's kind of fun and actually look at the original prediction and how closely the final uh, system coverage adhered to what the prediction said it would be. So we're going to confirm the accuracy or, or lack thereof of that prediction. So here's your, here's your space. Tell us a little bit about the space. Uh, yeah, so the UMBC Event Center is a fairly new facility, opened in 2018. Uh, its primary function its primary function is for uh, basketball and volleyball games. Um, so it's a horseshoe designed arena uh, and the, so there's kind of like a natural stage area in the end under that video screen. And the, the main house system is uh, five arrays of Meyer Lena speakers uh, all around uh, three 1100 LFCs for low frequency fun. And they're kind of all timed back to that center hang of subs. So as you go around the ring of the horseshoe, they're all timed back to that one point. Um, and then there's also a couple of UPQs that are firing straight down onto the basketball court for the players to hear and, and things like that. So if we look at the seating section a little bit, um, for this show, obviously you were seating folks uh, on, on the, the court area as well. Um, and which I understand is, is covered by the installed system, but not in a way that's helpful for uh, a live event, correct? Yeah, so here's the uh, map prediction from when the building was constructed about how it covers. Uh, so you can see that the Lena array is covering the, the seating sections and we call the upper and lower bolt, upper and lower section. Um, and then the, the UPQs are firing straight down onto the court. Um, so there's two kind of problems with that. If, if you kind of look closely, imagine where a stage would be on the left side of the screen. Um, there's not a lot of coverage over there from the UPQs, as well as if your people are sitting and facing a stage, the UPQs are firing straight down on them from 60 feet in the air. And that's just kind of an awkward sensation to have sound coming from way up there when you're looking, especially if you're sitting in a couple of front rows on the floor, you're looking only, you know, 30 feet in front of you. So, uh, you know, what we would talk about image distortion, right? So, so like the, 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 what I'm seeing and what I'm hearing aren't matching and you can really give somebody an uncomfortable day uh, if they have to listen to that. Here's a uh, sort of a cross section. Um, and it's the same thing that we see there's kind of the symmetry there in, in the flown system uh, of the Lena's plus the, plus the downfills. And those are, those are, those are truly downfills. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, eventually the, just the way the, the building is and how it gets covered. So like the UPQs are firing straight down and even those bottom Lena cabinets are firing pretty straight down. It's a pretty decent curve there. So if we look at the plan view here, um, you've got, if we're, if we're talking about putting a stage over here at the right side of the image, right at the end of the court, uh, the end zone, you have basically, since these are, these are in pairs, it's, it's symmetric back to the stage. So you have, uh, you have to choose a timing for the close pair and for the middle pair. And then for this guy down here on the end. So you have, you have three timing decisions to make in terms of how you're going to time this system back to that stage. Yeah. So uh, the, it's not pictured here, but the, the left, right, it kind of hung almost in line, I guess, with where the basketball hoop might be. And it kind of have to time it back to, to that area three times and make a decision about where I put my microphone and where, where I do that timing from. So if we look at, uh, this is your prediction here where you're, you're starting to plan out uh, how you're going to knit the, you're, you're flying in a, a leopard array for this event. Yeah. So uh, the main array we used was uh, 12 leopards per side. Uh, that decision was, Partially for coverage, partially for that's what we had. We have 24 leopards, so that's what we used. Um, and in a perfect world, I'd probably try to cover the whole place with a main hang and, and some outfills back from the stage, like you would traditionally in like a rock concert or whatever. But this is what we had, so this is what we're going with. So I did 12 per side, and that was enough to kind of cover that lower seating section and the floor. And then for the uh, upper section, I, I utilized the house 
Lena's and I just turned off the bottom half of that array and just covered the top section with that as a kind of delay system. So I think someone who's looking at this might say, well, you have half of a perfectly good array turned off. Why, why would you choose to turn off the bottom half of that array and try to cover that area with your mains rather than just let your mains cover the floor and use the whole Lena system? Again, it goes back to that kind of imaging thing and kind of that would have been a whole other timing issue of you have these lepers all the way at the other end of the arena and then these Lena's 50, 60 feet up pointing straight down at you. If you're sitting in the first couple of rows of, of the seating uh, bleacher section, then it's still another weird thing. So I try to cover as much as I can with the leopards. And we're throwing about 120, 130 feet with leopards, which they're perfectly adequate to do. So uh, this is this is kind of where you have to start to make some decisions, right? Uh, let's talk about how you decided to set the time um, for each of these interactions where you have, you have your flown system at the end by the stage here, and then you have to choose a, a time for each of these uh, flown Lena arrays. Yeah, so uh, first thing I did was, I, I, we kind of talked about it, I decided to make three timing decisions because I kind of had those Lenas in pairs plus that one uh, in the end zone by itself. Um, so I just kind of picked a spot and, and set the timing on one side of the arena and just kind of matched to the other side because if I move the mic over there, then a slightly different mic position is going to change the timing a little bit, and it doesn't really matter that much in the end. But what I decided to do was because of how the house was sold and because of the way the system is set up, I put a microphone on access to a leaner array in uh, one of the first couple rows of that 200 seating section, that upper section. And I, that was my delay point. So we can look at an example of that where you have, this is where, uh, where the nearest leaner array to the stage is firing. So this is sort of your on access point there. Mm -hmm. And uh, we have your data here that uh, you measured both the the flown Lena system and uh, your right main array at that point. And we can see that uh, sort of without processing, the Lena is getting there sooner, which is not surprising because it's closer. And so what, you just cho chose to delay the Lena back to the to the mains at that point? That's exactly what I did. And um, I did that just because I knew that most people were sitting in those first couple rows and there weren't as many people sitting in the overlap areas. So that's kind of where the most damage could be done. So that's where I did my timing decision. And there also aren't people sitting I mean, sorry, the people are just sitting there, so they're not really walking between the two timing sections. So while they might get some weirdness between the two Lenas, they're not kind of going back and forth through it, so it's not as noticeable. Right. And and really, I think you're going to end up with a situation where um, everyone's pretty much imaging back to the main stage, which is really what you wanted. And here's you know the same process done from the next section over. We can see now that... Um, the Lenas are much earlier than the stage because we're much further from the stage. So you needed a lot more delay um, to sort of get those two systems to, to lock in there. Exactly. So, you know, I think it's, it's worth talking about the fact that, like you mentioned, we do have some seats that are going to be in between the, the sort of the crossover between those two Lena arrays, and they're going to be getting two different arrivals there. Um, but it's a relatively small number of seats compared to the main area that's covered by each of those. And like you said, um, since everything's timed back to the stage, um, you kind of have to make this trade off, but you know, I think, I think you made the right call. It's probably a worthwhile trade off um, rather than trying to time those two Lena hangs together just for the, what 14 people that are in between those. And, and then everyone else in the coverage of either of those is going to have a very weird experience. Yeah. Again, it's just kind of making the, the tough decisions about, you know, what's going to be best for the most amount of people. And obviously we can see from these photos that, you know, compared to the seating on the floor, there aren't a ton of people that are seated up in that area. So you're, you are talking about a very small number of seats that would be sitting in that, in that crossover region. Yeah. Again, I think it was about 3,800 tickets were sold and the, the whole capacity in this configuration was about 4,800. Um, so those upper seats are the ones that didn't sell. I wasn't really too worried about it. The, the, the floor and the lower bowl was, was fairly sold out. Um, let's talk a little bit about tonal consistency. What are we looking at here? What we're looking at is all of the traces that are in a color are from each, each floor section. So there's six sections of the floor and I took a measurement from each of those. And then the, the black line is an average of all of that. Uh, and what I was just kind of was getting a, a look at it was how tonally consistent it is across the floor. Um, that way I can know when I'm at front of house, does it sound the same everywhere else? So, you know, what, what you're, you, you can, you can look at this and say, yeah, it seems pretty consistent over the space. So you have a, a high level of confidence that the decisions you're making at mixed position are actually going to be effective. 
Yes. And kind of the 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 really interesting thing to me um, is is this bit of data here. So tell us tell us what you've done here. So what this is is uh, the color traces are just measurements from around the venue, and one of them might even be the average that we looked at before. And then the the thick black trace is the export results from Sim and Map from the prediction software to show what um, what the prediction software said it was going to be or sound like and what it actually ended up being in the room. And we can kind of see that they're very similar, uh, which is very helpful for me to know that it is what I thought it would be. There's no weird things going on. There's nothing unexpected that I need to go hunt down and figure out why it's doing that and do I need to change something with the system. Um, so now that I can go in and know that, oh, this is what it should be, and that's what it is, and that's right. good. So I can kind of relax and, and kind of go through my process and, and knowing that I don't need to worry about something weird popping up. So it's sort of another confidence check or, you know, as we've talked about, uh, in a previous video, the idea of verification, like that, yes, everything's working as it should. I don't have something that's blown out. I don't have something that's wired improperly. And um, I think the big point here is that that time that you spent in the prediction software is effective because what we can see is that you designed a system to do a certain thing. And then this is what the software said it would do. And then when you went out in the field and hung that system, it actually did pretty much exactly what the software said it would do. And so that means that that time that you're spending working on your prediction, um, that's time well spent because that there is some really actionable data that, that comes out of there. And, you know, in a matter of speaking, the plan works, right? Yeah. I mean, doing, doing your homework is very important, not just to, to know that the prediction is right, but to know when you get into the, to the venue, how to pin your cabinets and all, and all that and where you're rigging from. Because if, if you do your prediction, but you didn't think about where you need to rig from, then that kind of changes where you hang your speakers, which changes how it results in the room, which means your prediction is kind of off. Um, and then the same thing with kind of pinning your cabinets, especially with the longer arrays, you know, you, you change each cabinet by one degree or half a degree times 12 cabinets. That's a pretty significant change. So to, to know what you're doing when you get in there um, and knowing what you might need to change if something does seem amiss uh, is really important to go in there with the confidence and knowledge of what you're doing. So I, I would say the takeaways from the work that you've shown us here is, you know, obviously the prediction is a very effective tool when you use it, when you use it properly, it can streamline your process on the day. It can make sure give you a high level of confidence that your design is behaving as intended. Um, and uh, the idea that, you know, whenever we're making a timing decision, we have to really think pretty carefully about um, the trade-offs that are involved in that and, try to make the best decision possible for as many uh, people as we can. Yeah, uh, timing decisions are all about kind of a compromise between where you put the microphone, where people are sitting, and where the person next to them is sitting. And until everyone's on some like headphones and IEMs, then timing is always going to be a compromise because things change based on where you stand. That's just kind of how physics works. Sam, thanks for your time. Thank you for having me.